You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Buzz Studios in Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menunos and Bing.com, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is AfterBuzz TV's Hemlock Grove After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's AfterBuzz TV's Hemlock Grove After Show. Oh yeah, Bing is for doing, <laughs> and here we are doing another amazing After Buzz TV After Show podcast for Hemlock Grove, and we're on season one, episode twelve, Children of the Night. <laughs> I am your host Chano, and I am joined here by my awesome and lovely lady co-host. Hi everyone, I'm Marissa Serafini. Hey guys, I'm Tiana Hobson. Hi there, I'm JJ Jurgens. And later on tonight, we have a special guest scheduled to call in via Skype. It's going to be Joel De La Fuente, or is it Joel De La Fuente? I think it's Joel. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. I mean, we'll ask him. He, play, he plays Dr. Johan Price on the show, mm -hmm. and it's going to be it's going to be an exciting interview. I hope give yeah. us some insight into the show from his perspective. And uh, we got the following topics in store for you guys to talk about. We're going to talk about Shasur dying. Aww. Aww. Christina is the killer. We called that. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> sworn, sworn goes nuts. So, and lastly, Shelly runs off. And if we have, you know, some extra things, we can throw them in there too. Because mm -hmm. there's a couple other things mm -hmm. that uh, merit talking about. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Shasur dies. Pretty much, right? You know, the episode opens up, right? And she's getting out of her, like, bag that she's in, trapped in that cage. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's ever been an episode or, like, a segment of a film that I've ever seen where they focus so much on a character who's, who's pretty much a protagonist escaping, from, trying to escape <laughs> from a situation, yeah. and then it ends up in yeah. tragedy. Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's upsetting. Uh, it, yeah. it was after all that work and like you said, and all that mm -hmm. time, and then it was just we just hear her scream like, oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> like wow. In a way, it was dissatisfying, but and yeah, yeah, I feel like also they had to be a little bit tasteful about it because she was, even though she was like kind of a biatch sometimes. You know, we didn't like her character as much. She was antagoniz antagonizing our favorite characters, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She, she she had a really tragic death. I feel. What what did you guys think? I feel bad for her because um, throughout all these episodes that she is interrogating people, maybe not in the best way, but, you know, we still kind of fell for her and you see her dark, tormented past and whatnot. So we've had the time to, you know, get to know this character and love her. Mm -hmm. And then she dies mm -hmm. yeah. in a very excruciating way. Yeah. It was the way that she went, you know, yeah. all that time she spent thinking that, you know, you, you ha they have us rooting for her as she's in that cage because, you know, she escapes and we're like, okay, now she can run away and get away from this and, you know, something good will happen for her and then it just doesn't. So it was <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of, I felt bad for her. I did like Shuster. I liked having her around just to kind of poke at people and make things, mix things up a little bit. I thought we also it might be more of a battle like when she died, you know, I don't, and it just it was all over so quick because... Right. So I didn't expect and that. And because you never got to find out after we just heard the gunshot go off in the previous episode with her and Olivia, and then the next time we see her mm -hmm. is in the cage. So it's like they they went to black on us twice. Yeah. And <laughs> one of these times, I just want to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole yeah. last episode, she she wasn't even there. She was completely absent. Yeah. We're like, dude, what happened to her? You mm -hmm. know, like the previous episode before, what was it? Episode it was episode ten, 10. where yeah. she ends up like where we get to see like the kids find the uh, the fi the gaming and wildlife truck mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's empty and she's not in there we never get to see what happens to it like the sheriff department it's, doesn't it's, impound it or anything right yeah no mm -hmm. not yeah. not we didn't see anything that happened to the truck but at the very end the very last scene of last week's episode we saw Shasur locked up in the cage mm -hmm. and we're like okay she's yeah. still alive then yeah so 
They mm-hmm. moved her there. Mm-hmm. Somebody <laughs> moved her. Wonder. Yeah, but uh, there was something really interesting. That there, there was a little bit of a conversation. Uh, if we fast forward a little bit. Well, you know what? Actually, let's talk about... Did you guys catch that conversation that Olivia was like... The one-sided conversation that Olivia was <laughs> yeah. doing with her? What was up with that? Yeah. She was talking about her childhood and, like, being laid down in the forest like, and, like, making out with guys and stuff. Is that, was that what she was talking about? Like, playing a game, right? Yeah. Wolves yeah. in the woods. Wolves in the woods. Yeah. yeah. It was very visual, very imagery, mm-hmm. and, like, kind of dramatic, like, an actress, like Olivia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is how she saw it every single time that she did it. And um, the, the thing was that this story that she was telling us, it kind of made me think like she has a thing against wolves. Even at, mm-hmm. a, a, younger, uh, at a younger age, she had something against wolves, wolves in the woods. Mm-hmm. Well, if we fast forward a little bit, uh, once Chasseur gets out, thanks to her belt buckle, right? She used that yeah. little thing, that, very inventive. So she gets <laughs> out, she ends up screaming, we don't see anything. We come back, and uh, later in the episode, Price walks in, and Olivia now has, this first time she's really had a (laughs) bloodied-looking white dress. And it wasn't even that much blood that was really on it, but it's just more than we're used to, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. She's she's so clean, and to see it with even the slightest bit of blood on it, I was like, whoa, she's a messy eater. That's kind of (laughs) crazy. Looks like we have a... Do we have a phone call, Stephen? Call you on the air with Hemlock Grove after show. And they hung up. Uh-huh. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I wonder if that's Joel or not. We'll they didn't want to talk to you, Steve. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully he'll be coming back. Uh, he'll try to call again. But uh, there was something really interesting uh, later on that Olivia mentions to Price. And she says, oh, it's still warm, by the way, you know, if you, need mm-hmm. it, if you have any use for it. So to me... Like, that sounds like she want, or rather that Price could potentially use her in an experiment of some kind and maybe bring her back. What I didn't it, think about that until the second time I watched the episode, but when I was re-watching, I was like, oh, could she still be alive? Yeah. Is he going to bring her back? I got really excited. I didn't think of it until last week mm-hmm. in our oh. interview, and then I was like, oh, that would be great. Like, I just, you know, assumed <laughs> mm-hmm. that she was dead, but when I watched it again, yeah, you don't, Necessarily, I mean, they make faces like he's killing her and she's dying, but she, he could have just made her pass out and take her somewhere else. I, th- I think the reason why she kept it warm because maybe like surgery, you know, how you keep organs still alive and they're still vital after like at least five minutes after death. So um, I think it was to preserve the organs for mm-hmm. as long as possible. But I like the way how the body, uh, how Shasora's body was kind of ripped open. It was like scientifically mm-hmm. like peeled apart, like to be studied. Because Olivia knew that Price was going to eventually take the body and study it. Yeah, hmm. that's that's a really interesting point. And it was such... It, there were so many times when Price was, like, looking down at her. And it seemed like he had a, a lot of respect for her, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, well, they're both doctors. And mm-hmm. even though the doctors are different things. And they, they were... Sounds like my mic went out. Steven? Uh, oh, there... Oh, okay, there we go. Thank you, Marissa. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it feels like... Price, you know, he was in a situation where she's like a colleague, and it, it just sucks that she had to end up like this. And uh, ultimately, he it felt like he was putting her out of her misery. Obviously, she was mm-hmm. she was in a lot of pain. She she had trouble breathing. What mm-hmm. did you guys feel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, he definitely had a soft spot for her, you know, and really liked her. And who knows on what level? But mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, which was also in- interesting and nice to see from his character as well, since he's usually so cold and. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. like a small moment of Price actually showing emotion a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of refreshing. And something mm-hmm. that um, Olivia said to Price, because Price seemed pretty upset that, I mean, for more more than the obvious reason of, you know, her killing Chasseur, but he said something, I forget their conversation, but she says something to him along the lines of, like, well, they should have known better than to cross me when they need protecting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who is she talking about the order? Like it does the Olivia, order of the dragon. Does she work with them because she's like cross me? So I don't know. I just was confused by the statement that she made because it made it seem like maybe she has more to do with them than she mm. leads on. But then Price says an interesting line to Chasseur before he you know but he says the line um, that they are similar 
But the thing is, she uh, Price didn't threaten Olivia, mm -hmm. and Shasor has done that on more than one occasion. And I think mm -hmm. just uh, she irked her, and that's the reason why Olivia decided to kill her, even though she didn't have to. That's interesting that you say that. I actually got something different from that conversation. I feel like um, he he said something to the well. I I didn't write it down. Like you probably paid more attention <laughs> yeah. to me, but I felt like the conversation was more he doesn't make threats he just does things so what he's doing like him putting her out of her misery it's actually like he's just doing it to you know because like he i don't know it just it felt like he's just doing it as a means to an end and he he's just going to do things and, and never make threats and never apologize for what he's going to do in a way i don't know I, could, I did write down one thing that he said, and he said, like, if only you'd listen to me, we're both part of something bigger than us, bigger than the not-so-different people we work for. The only difference is I don't threaten them, mm -hmm. and I can't quit when I'm so close. So I feel like he's just playing the game. Like, he, he knows there's things that, he, battles that he can't win or people that he can't threaten or push, and he's just trying to, like, get by and so that he can continue with whatever his purpose is or whatever th things he's trying to pursue with his experiments. The way I took it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Price knew his place with Olivia, and she sort of didn't, and that ultimately led to her untimely demise. Yeah, he has another <laughs> interesting monologue with his digital recorder, yeah. <laughs> which is so funny. I love the way he talks into it because he's so <laughs> purposeful. Yeah, and it's it kind of reminds me of the way I talk to Siri sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I like I take my notes. I've been taking it with Siri now, and I like just do I just like dictate to her instead of typing because it's so much faster. Even mm -hmm. though there's like errors and stuff, so it's so interesting <laughs> to see him doing that. And, uh, and it's, he had such an interesting thing about saying how he's a, like a lighthouse. He was comparing himself mm -hmm. to a lighthouse guiding lost ships at sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I wonder, though, if he's the one that's really lost. Like, he, he views himself as a lighthouse, mm -hmm. but maybe he's more like a ship because he's kind of, like, blinded by his obsession about Ouroboros. I, uh, yeah, I yeah. think that's a good mm -hmm. analogy. I think it's also the fact that he's trying to look for answers to his project. Um, he's trying to experiment on different things and just like that intuition that he, like that investigative kind of element that he has, like he's always searching for something too, mm -hmm. Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, anything else on, on Chester dying guys? Oh, there, there, there was another quick moment where um, Price takes her St. Jude necklace. Oh yeah. yeah. And yeah. I yeah. just like the symbol, symbolism of that because it literally shows that Chester has no hope left. Yeah. Yeah, because even asked yeah. her if she wanted to pray, she mm -hmm. was like, no. Nope. Yeah, she <laughs> said no. That that was really interesting too, because she she really has lost her faith, and mm -hmm. that's probably why she ended up dying, because she was so conflicted and she couldn't really choose which way to go, and I f I feel like maybe she should have just killed like a part of me if she really wanted to like get business done, she should have just killed Peter like right there instead of like <laughs> delaying it or whatever <laughs> yeah. and it led to her downfall she just didn't do things quick right away she like price said she just was like threatening everybody and she really didn't mm -hmm. want to hurt like the kids and stuff and she just wanted to get her job done and appease her uh, the the bishop but she she was just so internally conflicted it ended up being her downfall it was her hubris but like yeah. ironically be because she wasn't just listening to the so-called religious people who were saying to kill them her morals and values because he hasn't done anything wrong and there isn't anything bad about him so to kill him for nothing is a giant you know sin and so basically she she's doing the right thing which would be, be viewed right by god you know supposedly and then denying the the faith the people in the religion <laughs> in yeah. the church is what i'm trying to say and then Yes, but then doesn't want to pray. So it's an interesting dynamic. But at the same time, I feel like the the bishop and the father and all the people within the Order of the Dragon, they were only killing monsters because they were simply monsters, not because they had done anything wrong or not. Because they're like, oh, you're not human, therefore, we're, you know, you represent the devil on earth, yeah. so we're going to kill yeah. you. That's what I mean, yeah. They're not just in the reasons why they're, like, killing these people. And I think she had a conflict with that because she thought there's no reason to kill these kids because they're, you know... They haven't harmed anyone. They haven't, yeah. 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 And that also kind of goes with the religion and like I'm just thinking of the Vatican, the the way that um, they go after these monsters is usually because they kill these monsters because they, they weren't created by God. They were created by evil and like evil rules it and whatnot. And so that's the, another reason why they always just kill monsters straight up hmm. and without any second thought. Hmm. Well, uh, let's move on to our next topic. Uh, oh, before we do that, though, I wanted to mention 
that Serial Buddies is an awesome movie. Mm-hmm. You can go get it on the <laughs> iTunes store right now. Um, I bought it on standard definition, and it's like it's a pretty good price. You know, it's, it's enjoyable. It's funny. Pretty much, it's Dexter meets Dumb and Dumber. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Funny yes. movie. Uh, there's so many stars that are in it. We got uh, Chris, Christopher McDonald. He's in there. Christopher Lloyd. Oh my goodness, he's funny as like <laughs> one, of, one of the main characters' fathers. Oh man, and uh, Artie Lang's in it too. Ben Bears. Maria Menounos is in it, of course. Henry Kat- Winkler narrates. Yeah, Kathy mm-hmm. Lee Gifford. That's right, and it's written and directed by Kevin Undergaro, who's one of the co-founders of AfterBuzz TV here. So you guys go ahead and check it out. Show us some love. Help us keep the lights on here at AfterBuzz because we yes. need your help. That's right. So Christina's the killer. Yes, yes, we do that little evil little girl. <laughs> I went back to I wa- I rewatched our episode six, The Crucible, when Freya was in studio and she sat right where JJ is, and I was like, I don't know, maybe Christina's the Varg Wolf. And then later on, JJ in her predictions was like, I think Christina's evil, and that she might turn out to be the killer. So <laughs> go we us. nailed it six episodes ago. Yes. <laughs> Good I'm never job. right about anything. Guys. I was going to say, we might anything. not understand some other things going on, but we did know that one. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. So the episode where it first shows her in the episode, she's creepily standing outside the Godfrey's mm. home. And I'm yeah. not, I'm talking about Norman Godfrey. So Letha's inside. She's making her tea. Mm-hmm. And she just, she looks outside. There's nothing there. The second time she looks outside, bam, there's this white-haired girl <laughs> staring at her. It's like... It's like something out of the ring. Yeah, it yeah. Like, looked like the girl crawling out of the TV. Yeah. I almost expected the, the third look back, and then she'd be gone. And then all of a sudden, this wolf would be in there, like, attacking her, is what I was kind of yeah. thinking. <laughs> that would have been crazy. It set me up watching that, though. That yeah. was kind of scary, right in your face. It yeah. did. And it was so funny how it escalated, right? She mm-hmm. invites her in, and she's sitting down, and she's being, like, antagonistic right away, you know, but really, mm-hmm. like, quiet, diminutive kind of antagonistic, right? Mm-hmm. So... She ends up saying, like, you stupid effing bitch. <laughs> and she, like, whispers yeah. it so quietly. Yeah. And Letha turns around. She's like, wait, did she say something? Oh, I guess yeah. not. <laughs> da, 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 da. I'll pour some more tea. Yeah. But that's, that's, like, a quick moment showing that the animal inside her, she can't control it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, even her eyes, just, like, the way she was looking at her, she was, like, eyeing her like a piece of meat. Yeah. Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, ready yeah. to pounce any time, it seemed like. That was, yeah. <laughs> but that was crazy. <laughs> th- thankfully, as it goes on, Peter and Roman come to Letha's aid because she, I, I think she was kind of scared in a way, but then at the same time, it was like, okay, maybe we need to help her mm-hmm. because she wasn't mm-hmm. sure like what was going on, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. once Peter gets there, it was so crazy how her attitude totally switched. Mm-hmm. And yeah. she ended up, uh, she ended up uh, actually getting really friendly and she was looking at Peter in such like, like a nice way, like, oh, I like him, like, you know, you guys know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. JJ. Yes, sorry, <laughs> I was a little distracted. Hi, I'm yeah. <laughs> We're having some technical there. difficulties <laughs> up in here. Fast no, yes, yes, I, I totally agree with you. Like, she instantly yeah. changed, yeah. and she, yeah, it was like she was. You she, couldn't decide if she was like kind of, you know, flirting to get close to, yeah. you know. I thought she kind of became more childlike and innocent. Yeah, Yeah. like right right when Peter came, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was like, hi, how are you? And then, you know, later on when she's talking about how, you know, she kissed him and kind of has like this crush on him, then I was like, oh, okay. Like, she became a a 14-year-old with a crush on that older Mm -hmm. boy. Pretty much. I kind of saw it as like one person's recognizing the other person Mm -hmm. on the same level. Yeah, I definitely think when he looked back at her that he... like. He kind of knew mm-hmm. something was up with Christina. Mm-hmm. Well, because he said earlier, or and maybe her white, later. her white hair is not a dead giveaway. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. No. yeah totally. I love how they don't even question that either. They're like, oh, okay. Sure. But he had said also, the, and I can't remember if it was before or after, but he's like that, um, uh, oh, it was it was before, I think, because he says, oh, I'm sorry, maybe, that uh, they can feel each other now. Like, they both know mm-hmm. that they're out there, and they can feel, and he can he can feel it feeling him yeah. <laughs> as well. So. He said that I think they um, knew at that moment also. Yeah, that he wasn't going to have to go very far mm-hmm. in order to get there. So. You know, the crazy thing is that she's known all along that he's a werewolf. And she's been, why has she been blabbing it to everybody? Is she, was she trying to take, like, the attention off of her? She didn't know. She didn't know. She didn't know she for was, sure. She didn't know she was a werewolf. She was a werewolf, oh. yeah. yeah. It was kind of like she had yeah. the splurt, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde yeah. thing going on where oh. she's one person and then maybe she goes to sleep in. 
does all these things and doesn't remember it in the morning and maybe has vague memories of it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. She said later on, Christina doesn't know she or didn't know when she feels badly for what she's, you know, who she's harmed. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't even yeah. think about it like that at all. I, I didn't pick up just, on it until mm, the second time I watched, though, <laughs> when they were talking. Because I was like, oh, how did she not know that she was doing all this yeah. stuff? Yeah, I felt like she was just lying to everybody and just, mm -hmm. like, playing everybody like a fiddle. Yeah. Oh, that's really weird. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The, she, she ends up changing her, like, attitude so much during this episode, right? She mm -hmm. goes from being, like, antagonistic and, like, predatory towards Letha. When they're mm -hmm. in the car in the Prius going to the general store, she is being, like... She's acting like she has a crush on Peter, mm -hmm. right? And they're in the backseat, and then he starts apologizing to her, and he's being nice to her. And she's, like, returning it, you know, giving him good looks and everything. Um, but she still looks kind of creepy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just lulled us, I think, as the audience. So it definitely lulled me into a false sense of security. Because I was like, okay, maybe there's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> and she also drops a hint that, um, you know, when she's talking to Peter in the car, that she's, uh, Peter's like, why do you think he's after you? And she's like, I don't know. And Peter's like, I know the feeling. So I, I, I kind of saw it as like that same level that they're on. Like, he knows what it's like to be a werewolf. He knows this... Uh, um, this feeling that he can't control it and then she can't control it either so i think it's just another level of connection um what their there's similarities between each other mm -hmm. yeah. so fast forward a little bit to them being in the sanctuary at uh, everybody starts sitting down peter he's like getting the electrical cord ready to use it like a rope right <laughs> at first i was like okay that could be used like a rope but i wasn't sure yeah and i was like what are, they, are they gonna like electrocute the varg wolf <laughs> <laughs> i was like is that gonna yeah. hold a varg wolf yeah i i don't know i think we have another caller on the line caller you on the line with hemlock grove after buzz tv after show hey uh it's joel it's joel del fuente uh, hi. hi joel hey joel uh this is sean how are you guys Good. Oh, great. Good. Thanks. This is Sean O here. I'm um, joined with uh, three lovely co-hosts of mine, and we're going to be asking you some questions. Thanks so much for joining us this evening uh, to, to talk about your character and the show. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I got my hair cut and everything, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, how did you get your start? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background um, as an actor and what are some of the shows that you've done um, in your credits and uh, uh well, let's start with your past. How, how did you get into acting? Like, where'd you grow up? Where, where'd you go to school and such? Uh, I grew up uh, in the suburbs of Chicago, and um, I started doing theater uh, when I was in high school. And then uh, I studied it uh, uh, when I went to college in Rhode Island. I went to Brown University and then um, went to acting school right after Brown uh, to the grad acting program at NYU. And then... Um, yeah, and then from there, I uh, right when I graduated from school, I worked a little bit in theater in New York, and then went and did a um, a sci-fi show for Fox. Um, that same year, I graduated from school called Space Above and Beyond, and then um, and basically uh, have been doing you know television and, and theater primarily um, since then. Uh, I've been on uh, Law and Order Special Victims Unit for the last ten years or so, mm -hmm. uh, recurring, playing a character named Morales. And uh, I've never had an opportunity to play anything quite like Dr. Johan Price, so it's been very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so what attracted you to choose Hemlock Grove? Well, it's one of those situations where, you know, as an actor, um, you're always kind of uh, perpetually looking for work. And this was a great instance where we both kind of seemed to find each other. Um, I, I have kind of a, I had kind of a um, funny uh, introduction to the show. I... Um, about a year ago, or it was a year ago in April, I, I got obsessed with Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just kind of, I wanted to talk like Morgan Freeman. So, uh, as I'm sure everybody kind of wants to. So, <laughs> uh, I, just, I just started um, walking around the house, and I do this from time to time. So, I, you know, I get obsessed with certain people and stuff. So, I, I was trying to talk like Morgan Freeman, and I was driving my wife insane. <laughs> um, because she'd be like, you know, can you pass the salt? And I'd be like, I'm trying to pass it. And I'm just trying to kind of do a... Morgan Freeman, and so she was like, you know, please stop that. So I posted on Facebook. I said, you know, I'm trying to talk like Morgan Freeman. My wife wants to kill me. And so then people left comments saying, oh, you should, you know, you should post a video of it, which I never do. But I was walking up, you know, I was walking up the stairs reading this, like, on my phone, and I just kind of turned the camera on, and I said, you know, I'm trying to talk like Morgan Freeman, um, you know, in my Morgan Freeman impersonation of the day. And so people were like, oh, that's great. That's really funny. 
Uh, and so then I mentioned it to my uh, one of my best friends is uh, the actor Daniel Day Kim, who's on um, who was on Lost, and now he's on Hawaii right. Five-O. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to him on the phone. I said, "Hey, did you did you hear that uh, Morgan Freeman impersonation I did on Facebook?" And he said, "It was okay." <laughs> what, do you mean it was okay? what do you mean okay? And he said, "Well, you said you know I'm trying to talk like Morgan Freeman. I mean, you're kind of apologizing for it. You didn't go all the way with it." So I said, "Oh, that's that's interesting." So then, um, I, you know, I was putting my kids to bed that night, just staring at the ceiling like furious. <laughs> so I get up, I get up at like midnight. I go downstairs. Uh, uh, I, I get on the web. I um, I find the um, the uh, rehabilitated speech from Shawshank Redemption. I learn it in like 15 minutes, and then I I video myself just 100%, just going for it, doing Morgan Freeman. Then I I post it. And then I call Dan, who lives in Hawaii, and I say, hey, is this going all the way enough for you? And I go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then the next day, you know, Dan posts on his Facebook. He's like, this is the best Morgan Freeman impersonation I've ever seen. So, so I think to myself, okay, that's done. The Morgan Freeman thing is done. But then a couple of days later, I get, a phone, I get a message out of the blue from a woman that I haven't talked to in years who I went to acting school with. And she says, have you talked to anyone lately, and have you gotten a job? Those are the only two questions <laughs> she asked me. So I thought she got hacked. So I, I wrote her back, and I said, hey, it's so great to hear from you. Um, job, I don't know. Uh, did you write this? So then she sent me back a really long reply saying that she was uh, at a wedding that weekend in Mexico. A mutual friend of ours getting, was getting married there, and she met um, this woman um, at the wedding, and they totally hit it off, and they were talking about stuff, and they were talking about – um, great movies that are shot in Mexico because they were there. And they were like, oh, Shawshank Redemption. Um, you know, the end of it takes place in Mexico. And my friend said, oh, you know, it's so funny. This friend of mine did this Morgan Freeman impersonation, plays it for her on her phone in Mexico. And the woman uh, is really taken with this video. Um, you know, and they're talking about it all weekend. Turns out this woman is a former um, NBC executive, and she's now the um, the CEO of a new production company, uh, a new um a new company called Goma International, um, which is producing television shows, and one of the first two projects they're doing is Hemlock Grove. It's a woman named Katie O'Connell. And they've been trying to cast this part, this part of Johan Price, and they can't find anybody. And for some reason, um, her seeing this Morgan Freeman impersonation gets her thinking, I think this guy is weird enough to maybe play <laughs> Johan Price. <laughs> so from, from that video, um, you know, they call my agent and set up an appointment for an audition. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I, I fall in love with the part right away and the script. I work really hard on this audition, send in this tape, don't hear anything for a month. And I think, oh, that's too bad. That would have been the best story. Um, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm writing my friend that day saying, thanks so much for the beginning of a great story that never was, you know. And then I get a call from my agent a month later saying, hey, do you remember that thing you auditioned for, Hemlock Grove? I said, yeah. And they said, well, they're making you an offer. And I said, well, who do I have to meet? Who, I to, who, who do I have to go in and meet with? And they said, nobody. They're making an offer. And I said, <laughs> I haven't met anybody. And, and they said, we know. And I said, I, nobody, I, I haven't met anybody in person. And they said, it's the strangest thing, but, you know, they'd like you to be in the show. <laughs> wow. That's great. <laughs> what an awesome story. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Hey. <laughs> so, you know, when I showed up in, in Canada, you know, like weeks later, after all this happened, I was convinced I was going to get fired because <laughs> I thought nobody has ever met me. I'm going to show up and they're going to be like, oh, no, 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 no. We, uh, we're terribly sorry. This terrible mistake has happened. Um, and as it turns out, we just said, I just had the greatest time up there. Oh, that's great. Aww. Awesome. Do you mind if we play a, a quick maybe five or ten seconds of your Freeman video? Right now? Sure. Wow, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> We're speedy. <laughs> Steven, you want to go ahead? Wow, yeah, sure. sure. Let's see. Trying to let it's buffering right now. It's buffering. Oh, okay. It's buffering. So, uh, Marissa, did you want to watch a qu- uh, oh, go yeah. ahead and uh, ask a question while we waiting Jill, for that? Hi, Jill. Thank you for calling in. I, I love sure. uh, I love how Price is so stoic and kind of emotional, and even though he has this uh, physical strength. It compensates for his lack of emotion. Were there any challenges in acting wise um, that you had to face while portraying Price? Um, yes. Uh, you know, it, in my in my everyday life, I um, I tend to be very, uh, if anything, overly expressive. You know, with uh, in my interaction. So it was so interesting to play somebody who um, doesn't express anything. So it was a real challenge. 
uh, and very interesting and fun for me to um, really try to have um, as little expression as possible. Certainly at the beginning of the series, like as, as things go on near the end, I think very um, very unusual things are happening in everybody's lives, and so I think he's behaving somewhat differently than he normally does. Um, but it was it was a real challenge at first, and then just a real. Uh, treat and just you know a real release to get to be someone completely different than who I am in my everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Let's go ahead and play that uh, little clip. Well, now let me see. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> I know what you think it means, Sonny. To me, it's just a made-up word, a politician's word, so that. Young fellas like yourself can wear a suit and a tie and have a job. What do you really want to know? Am I sorry for what I did? Wow, I'm wow. amazed. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I thought Morgan Freeman was just playing on as a track and you were moving your mouth just now. That was amazing. I thought Morgan Freeman was wearing your skin right there, Joel. I think he was in the room yeah. with us. He's definitely one of my all-time voices, and you just nailed it. <laughs> oh, that's really nice, you guys. That's, yeah. that's something like, a, like late night... A little bit of whiskey and a little bit of competition will, will do for you. <laughs> but your, your lesson shows us you, we shouldn't be afraid to post those late night drunken videos that we do. <laughs> you know, I, I got to say, it's, you know, it really did, it, it taught me this interesting lesson, which is that you, you know, as an actor, we have such, we often have such little control um, over so many of the things that we do. So I think you just got to put it out there, you know, like, I, you know, I don't know if it's literally like every time you have to make a video and put it on Facebook, but I, I think just the, the general lesson is that you have to put yourself out there in whatever ways you can, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. I mean, when I think back on that story, it just kind of makes me think, well, that's one of those stories where I guess it, I guess I was just supposed to play this part at this particular time because it just was such a huge long shot, you know, I mean, and, and just such... I mean, because all the people who ended up seeing that video, they're all like such a diverse, amazing, great group of people and people I never would have met or had I met them without them seeing that video first, we, we might have had a completely different interaction. Mm -hmm. So it was a great way to kind of get into meeting some really amazing people. Yeah, yeah. definitely. We were talking earlier about your last scene with Chasseur there and kind of how we saw a little you for once have kind of feelings and a fondness towards another person. Can you talk a little bit how about how how you decided to what you felt were those, those feelings you had for her and your relationship? Sure. Uh, well, everything starts uh, everything starts with um, Brian's book. Um, and I think, you know, there there was a big there were a lot of um, clues and starting points, and in some instances, just things spelled out very clearly for me um, about where he was coming from. And then when we were shooting stuff, like things changed a little bit, or you know, they couldn't they couldn't do certain things that they did in the book, or they added on certain other aspects, or things had to change. And then, of course, the last part was meeting the people that we're working with and and being in the places. You know, like it makes a big difference to. Um, be in that location, first of all, um, which is, I mean, it's this cold, um, dark, really uh, spooky place. And then when you're there with somebody like um, with Candace, who's so amazing and so incredibly likable, um, everything just kind of falls into place, you know, I mean, how could you not like, how could you not love, you know, Candace? I mean, you met her last week. Yeah, she's kind of awesome. Thing, so. That's great. Now, um, so that was a lot of fun. That that actually ended up, you know, it's so funny. Like you have these really intense days, and um, a lot of the time it's like those really emotional, dark days end up being fun, um, well remembered days. You know, I mean, we we had a blast doing that stuff. Even though, you know, poor Candace is, <laughs> is, you know, she's got no clothes on. She's covered, <laughs> you know, in blood and lying on. God knows what, like on this concrete that who knows what's happened in that room. And, you know, <laughs> they have to have like a coat and heaters turned on her while they're rolling camera, and then they turn them off right at the very last second. I mean, that's how cold it was. Um, but we, we were having a blast. That's awesome. okay. So uh, speaking of having a blast, like I, I can obviously your character um, has 
Price has like amazing strength. All right, now we're up to episode 12 right now. And I don't know if it, I've watched half of the last episode. Is mm-hmm. it ever explained like where Price gets his strength from? Does did he experiment on himself? Um, you know, there it, it, literally spe- there is an explanation that's in the book, and then it's changed a little bit for the purposes uh, of um, of the television show. Um, then certain things were explained to me uh, by Brian. You know. Um, going into it to help me but you know what i've learned is unless unless it's made explicit in the show um they might want to have a different reason for it come out later so i shouldn't maybe even uh talk about well, what explanation was given to me because it seems to me that um they might have some different designs for it later you know mm-hmm. um but in, in in the book i can say uh, it, it was a slightly different situation in the book he was born um he, he he's such a interesting character. I mean, he was born fully with a f- fully developed ego, like even as a baby. He remembers his own birth. He, he, had his, he had a full sense of himself right when he came into the world. And he also was born with um, uh, extreme physical strength, except it, it manif- you could see it physically. So he was, in the book he's described as, like, you see him, you can see the muscles through his shirt. Oh, and, wow. um that's something that I could not, unfortunately, bring to the table. So they needed to do something else. So they came up with this, uh, with hysterical strength, as opposed to um, this medical condition that exists, where people have like overly developed musculature. Now, when you crushed that one digital recorder kind of early in the season, uh, what was that made uh-huh. of? Oh, that was a real one. I, you know, I take my job very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it, you know, it's it's yet another victory for the. Um, uh, for the prop department, you know, they have, uh, they had constructed a number of those things, and and um, I guess you're half you're halfway through the last episode. There's another, uh, there's another example of his strength that you'll see later on. That was um, an even better job that the props department does. Um, nice. Yeah. That shows yeah. his strength. Very good. Um, now I've been I've been going back and forth because Dr. Price and me, our relationship is rough right now because <laughs> in this last episode, in episode 12 is when I kind of was like, oh, okay, like, yes, he's showing emotion, I like him. But before this, he's been kind of cold and distant, so I have him labeled as, like, evil, no-gooder. Um, mm-hmm. What are your feelings? Do you think that Dr. Price is purely just evil, or does he actually have a conscience and a good side? Um... As you might guess, I I don't think he's evil at all. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I think actually um, he uh, he really feels like he is doing he is there to do something very specific in the world. He has a very clear sense of what it is, and he feels it's it's his mission in life and it's it's his responsibility. Um, he's the only person in the world that can do this thing and he feels like he has to do it everything else is not important uh, in comparison so um you know he is kind of um uh like a um a reimagining of you know the um the mad scientist kind of archetype so he if you're someone who's been put into the world and you you feel like you are uniquely situated to solve one of the great problems or one of the great um conundrums that's faced mankind forever and you feel that that's your purpose in life and everything else kind of takes a back seat you know you 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 have to get it done and that's i think the perspective that he has you know he's so close to solving the mysteries of life and death and um and he's going to do it no matter what so if that involves having to be um olivia's uh lackey so so he can have the facilities and the protection to do what he needs to do then he'll do that um, if it means um, certain people have to die, then he'll do it. Uh, he's not necessarily happy about it. I mean, you know, near the end, I think he's, you start to see that he feels like maybe he's gotten in a little too deep with Olivia, like the things that he's had to do. I mean, he, you know, as you discover in that scene with Chasseur, it turns out that he's been following behind her for years, cleaning up her little um, her little messes that she makes along the way. And, um, and it's starting to take a real toll on him because – you know, even though he acts in such a peculiar way, he still is human. So mm-hmm. he is paying a price to do the things that he's doing. Exactly. A price with an I and not a Y. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you, you, I've seen you post a lot of fun behind the scenes photos of you and the cast, some of the cast mes- members. Are there any like fun stories that happen on set and when the cameras weren't rolling that you can tell us? <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> There's so many. I mean, um, uh, honest. I mean, honestly, now you can't. There, it's such a great group of people, and everyone is so you know uh, distinctive. You know, everyone that has. Um, uh, everyone is so unique uh, and brings something so uh, particular to their characters and to the set. So, um, you know, uh, here, here's what's something I can say. I guess, you know, there's a scene, oh, I don't know, I, this might happen in, in the last episode, I'm not sure, but uh, there, is a, there is a scene where basically it's, it's with Olivia and with Norman um, and I, and uh, Norman is writing something down on a piece of paper for me. And, um, you know, we, we must have had to do, you know, between, like, close-ups and, you know, different camera angles and just, you know, having to reshoot the same things over and over. He had to probably write, you know, 30 or 40 times on this piece of paper. And <laughs> every time he would, <laughs> he was writing me little notes. Um, <laughs> And they were, you know, it, it was Dugray, but it was kind of Dugray kind of in character. It, it's like um, he was writing me, he, you know, he was basically writing Price very nasty things, like like really, <laughs> really nasty things. And then he would even draw me little nasty pictures. <laughs> so it got to be hilarious because I got to, it, it got to the point where Fomke and I were just really looking forward to see what picture he was going to draw, you know, and we were hoping that maybe the, we'd have to do another one so we would get another picture. So, um and the the most raunchy one of all, I basically saved for myself. It's actually sitting here on my shelf right now. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> um, so you know, it, it's funny because when I when I see that scene, that's what I'm thinking of when I when I watch that scene on television. I was thinking, oh, that must be the one where he drew the X Y Z. Nice. Hemlock Grove coffee table yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> So, um, Joel, what's the biggest difference for you being a feature film actor ver- or a television actor versus doing work for Hem- uh, Hemlock Grove on Netflix? The, the difference for working for Netflix? Um, you know, there really is something to be said about, uh, I mean, Netflix is, they feel like they're really, onto something and um you know they have numbers uh on their viewership that nobody else has and i guess similar to price you know like similar to price they feel like they are a company that's positioned to do something that nobody else can do and they're going to do it um good metaphor Mm -hmm. they're they're going to create um this new way um, of of consuming television, of consuming entertainment, uh, and as part of that, they have the confidence, um, the, um, the, the the confidence and the bravery to to boldly go and do it. You know, like it, it's been really interesting to read um, critical response, not just to Hemlock, but you know, some you know, House of Cards basically. Uh, was treated very well by the critics overall, but you know, Arrested Development, and and all the things you know, and Hemlock, and all the things that have felt critics have been very um, aggressively negative, by and large, about a lot of the stuff that's been coming out. And I think so much of it has little to do with the content, because often they they were reviewing and talking about stuff they hadn't even seen the whole piece. In fact, sometimes they'd only seen like one or two hours of it. And they were writing very aggressively about the whole piece. And I really feel it's because um, Netflix is challenging the entire model that it's based on. You know, they're challenging the entire way people um, conceive of their entertainment or, you know, conceive of how they're going to watch it and how they're going to consume it. And, um, uh, and when you have that vision and when you have that confidence, um, you're a really great wonderful partner to work with you know and and for for me and i think for most of us working on hemlock grove it was really um an exciting time because once they decided to make this project which is before i ever even showed up by the time i showed up and it was happening they were completely
completely behind the project. So, you know, you would show up and the times that Netflix folks would be there would be really exciting because, you know, we felt like we were part of something new and exciting and they had so many great ideas, you know, about where this was going to go. And and yet no ideas about what the project was going to be. Like they, they just let the creative, you know, team do what they were there to do, which was to tell this particular story. So it was very exciting. Uh, I believe our uh, engineer, Stephen, has a question for you. Hey, Joel. It's, hey, uh, Stephen. How's it going? It's Stephen the Booth, controlling the ones and twos here. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. Really enjoying the, uh, the conversation. I want to ask you... Um, a few years back, you played in the one-man show called Hold These Truths, and yeah. it had it had a lot of good reviews and everything, and then you reprised the role recently this year for the Solonovo Festival, and I'm wondering, are you planning on doing any more theater production in the future? Like, what's your next step with in theater right now? Uh, th thanks for that question, Stephen. I appreciate it. It's... Uh, um, Hold These Truths is a play that... Uh, Basically, I've been involved with for a couple of years, but we didn't really have a full production of it until this past fall in New York. In fact, I was doing it the same time I was shooting Hemlock Grove. I was flying between Toronto and New York, and um, which made for probably the most exciting creative time I've had as an actor ever, like doing working on these two things at the same time. And we just finished this run, as you mentioned, for the Solo Nova Festival last week in New York. Um, our hope is is that this play will continue to perform. Um, in various places. You know, we just performed it in Hawaii. Um, you know, I mentioned my friend uh, Dan Kim, who lives in Hawaii. He he saw the show and loved it and thought people in Hawaii would respond to it, and he co-produced a production in Honolulu. So we went and did that for a few performances, which was amazing. Um, so ho the, hopefully the idea is, you know, uh, Hold These Truths will um, have a life in between other things and will be able to go around to different parts of the world uh, and hopefully back to New York again, um, you know, and just have kind of a, an, on, an ongoing life. Um, it's a really wonderful play uh, by a woman named Jeannie Sakata. Um, and just the other day I was asked, uh, actually the next theatrical piece I'm going to do is, um, is actually going to be, I guess it's going to be in a couple of weeks. Um, it's, uh, there's a group in New York, this fantastic group called The Civilians, and they're doing um, an original piece on death. Uh, and people's relationship to death. And what they've done is they've gone out and, and interviewed all these different people, many of whom um, are dying. And so uh, I was approached to, um, to do a, a monologue of uh, uh, this man named Fred Ho, who is um, he's a, uh, he's a saxophonist and a, and a, a very accomplished one. And he's, he's in the, he's dying of cancer. And, He's had cancer for several years now, and he, so he's had a long relationship with, um, with the whole process. And uh, hearing him talk about, because he's completely at peace and acceptance with the fact that he's going to die, and he's going to die relatively soon. Um, his perspective is so interesting and so, um, uh, it's, it's scary, it's exciting, it's un unexpected. Um, it's amazing. He just, you know, you know, it's it's like a 45-minute interview, and they've edited edited it down. I, I just got the um, the finished version today. I, th I think it's only it's only going to be about three or four minutes long, the piece. Um, but what happens when you've completely accepted the fact that you're, you know, that you're going to die, and you're not fighting that part of it anymore? So he's basically living in the moment right now. He's not saving anything for the future. Um, one of the things he says is a lot of people say now that, you know, you've gotten really mean. <laughs> and he says, I'm not mean at all. I just am speaking completely honestly because I don't have time to not be anymore. You know, I'm not messing around with that anymore. So it's, so, so that's the, that, that's what I'm working on right now. I'm really excited about it. They're going to do it, uh, in a church in Brooklyn where basically a few pieces will be, um, um, structured in a way where everybody who comes to the church will, be passing through certain areas, and this is one of those pieces where if you come, you'll definitely come and you'll see me do this this particular monologue. But then you can explore the entire church, the entire area, and there will be people in the corners doing a piece. You know, some people might not see that person. And then you can go upstairs, downstairs, wherever, and basically the whole space will be full of all these stories about um, people uh, living with death, basically. 
is there an added pressure to playing a character that is not really a character, it's actually a person, like, of course, with Hold These Truths and Now Your New Project, you're playing somebody who's real, and people who know this person will be seeing you play them, people who have seen this person. Like, is there an added pressure to that? There is. Uh, um, you know, uh, there is. Um, with this particular piece, um, added to that is the fact is the, the time constraint, which is that... Um, you know, I think that's part of the nature of this particular piece. There, it's there, you don't have a lot of time to prepare. So, um, you know, it'll be really interesting also because it's what you're, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Like, are we trying to, I, I don't think the point is to um, mimic the person or to try to convey the sense that I am, um, like, like with the Morgan Freeman piece, for example. I'm, you know, in that instance, my main objective was to sound like Morgan Freeman. Like that, that's what the idea was. Um, here, uh, certainly that's going to come into play, but sounding like him is going to be a way for me to try to find my way into uh, the deeper aspect of what he's talking about and what he's saying, and that's what I'm going to try to interpret, you know. Um, so, you know, if he comes to the show or if people who know him are there, of course there's going to be that added pressure, but I think... I think um, my responsibility as a uh, as a performer in this instance, as an interpreter of that text, um, is to give light to his ideas that he's talking about. Uh, less so much, you know, being a carbon copy of who he is. He he is a very interesting person. Just in the couple of days that I've um, spent knowing I'm going to do this piece, you can YouTube him. His name is Fred Ho H O, and he is just. A really interesting, interesting man, and very distinct too. You know, he has like a mini uh, mohawk, um, <laughs> and he uh, and and he's very uh, strong, um, and uh, he doesn't hold back. So, he's thanks, an interesting Joe. Guy. Appreciate it. Uh, as, as yeah, an, thanks, Steve. Yeah, as an actor, what do you? What kind of qualities do you get out of live performance in theater that you don't necessarily get out of Hemlock Grove? What sticks to you the most? Uh, the audience, which uh, the, the audience is the huge difference. Um, the, the presence of people who are there right in front of you, um, it bas it, it's, it's just the most, um, it's the most basic reminder of what it is that, that um, we as actors are trying to do, which is to tell a story. And so, um, and in, you know, for this play that um, I just did, it's a one-person show, so it really is um, acting at its most basic essence, which is one person telling a story to a group of other people, and um, that relationship is such an amazing one. Um, it's a terrifying, exhilarating um, event, you know, because mm -hmm. every night you're stepping up in front of people who you don't know, um, who you can see who you are breathing the same air as, and you are going to spend that time together um, on this particular story. You know, and when you think about it, it's, it's actually um, the opposite, you know, of Hemlock Grove, because this is a whole new model. Like, we're not even all sitting at our TVs on Sundays at 10 doing it. You know, like, um, we're all going to do it at our own time and at our own pace. One of the great things I like about After Buzz, which I thought was really cool, uh, especially with um, the Netflix shows, is that you guys have, you know, you guys have a structure, um, you know, and I know that uh, some of you saw the whole thing really fast, but <laughs> you structured it so you're going to talk, and you know who I am talking about. Um, but um, you know how, like, you're going to structure it in a way where the main focus will be on a particular episode. Um, so in a way, you're almost like, it's, it's almost like having a book club um, and some people have read ahead, and some people haven't, but you, you can all convene together. And in that sense, you know, it's like, that's the part that reminds me of, the, you know, of theater, where you can all get together and share the experience. But we can also go off and, and, and you know, have our experience on our own if we, want to be, if, if we want to watch four episodes, we can. But, you know, we can get together and talk about the things we really liked or didn't understand or really hated together. And I, I think that... Um, you guys really help complete the circuit in that in that respect. You know, I, I really think that um, 
you know, because I know when I was growing up, loving movies and loving TV shows and stuff, what I loved, what I wanted more than anything was to talk about it with people who were um, as passionate about it as I was. And, and that's what you guys um, are providing, and I think that's really cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joel. I think that's one of the nicest <laughs> yeah. like, accolades and compliments we've ever gotten here at AfterBuzz yeah. TV. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Sure, but that is what you guys are doing. All, you know, I, you know, because I've I've seen I've seen a bunch of your episodes too, and it's, you know, even, you know, if if you see any episodes and you don't particularly like them, you can't really tell because I was watching really hard. <laughs> I was like, who who didn't like that episode? Nope. You, you, you all, you, you know, and even if you didn't like it, you've all like you're all checking your notes, and everything. Like you know. It's, very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and even, <laughs> even if there's some episodes we don't like, we always find something within the episode that stands out mm -hmm. to us, which we can mm -hmm. talk about, which we which we enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, what other projects do you have uh, uh, other than your theatrical projects we just talked about? Um, do you have coming up in the near future? Um, that's you know. Gosh, I, I'm so um, hesitant to even bring this up because this is this has even come up. Um, this has come up since you've uh, tweeted uh, and about potential questions and stuff. I'm basically waiting to see what the future of the play holds and what the future holds for Hemlock Grove, basically. So I'm I'm waiting on um, things that already exist at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Is there a television or film role out there um, that you are dying to play, or you know, some character that you would really like to tackle? Um, I, you know, I just I love to work. You know, I, I just and I, I guess so much of it. You know, there's so many different reasons. There's so many different um, kinds of challenges that come up from working. And I'm I just uh, it, it's 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 great to get to work with. Um, uh, ex, you know, just exciting people in the field. So it, it's not just even specific roles. Sometimes it can be people to collaborate with, you know, like um, theater directors or writers that I admire or, you know, television directors or producers. Um, you know, just getting it, you because know, once you get in a room with people, that's where interesting things happen. You know, you can, you can read uh, Brian's novel and then you can read like um, the great adaptations that they have. And but until you get in a room, you know, until you're looking at, um, you know, until you're looking at Nicole, like right, you know, on set, you're never quite sure how it's going to go. And um, it's really exciting and fun when you have an opportunity to do it with people who are, you know, at the top of their field and stuff. It's mm -hmm. uh, so. I just, I, you know, I just want to have more and more of those opportunities. Fascinating. Well, I, I think that about uh, does it for our interview with you, Joel. We're actually kind of running out of time here, but we wanted to thank you so much for joining us here at AfterBuzzTV.com's uh, Hemlock Grove podcast, and we hope to have you back again maybe in the future if we have any more podcasts. Sure. Well, I, I'd love to. Um, I really enjoy what you guys are doing. Thanks for having me on, and um, I hope you enjoy uh, – the conclusion of season one, and here's hoping that we uh, get together and talk about it, another one for season two. Okay, yeah, I'm sure good. We Thank will. you so much. Thanks so much, Joel. Where can we follow you? Sure. Oh, yeah. uh, any media platforms we can, the audience can follow you? Oh, sure. Um, uh, I'm I'm followable um, pretty much at my name at Joel De La Fuente uh, for Twitter, for Instagram, Snapchat, um, <laughs> and then uh, on Facebook, I'm at Facebook.com/slash the Joel De La Fuente. Uh, and I'd love it if people would follow me. Awesome. We'll get some, yeah. Hopefully some of our AfterBuzz fans will go ahead and give him a follow. Uh, but again, Joel, thank you so much. It's Joel De La Fuente who plays Dr. Johan Price on the Hammock Grove. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank it's you. a pleasure, you guys. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Okay, take care. That was fun. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great, <laughs> Great yeah. interview. So we left so off. So well spoken. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we continue it's talking. So <laughs> not evil at all. Yeah, it was so, so nice. nice. I was like, oh, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. Such a nice guy. And man, he was great as mm -hmm. Morgan, Morgan Freeman in that yeah. bit. Oh, oh my was. gosh. Uncanny. Yeah. Uh, so, our After Buzz fans, don't forget to check out the new website. It's already up mm -hmm. as of, uh, I don't know when we launched yes, it this past. We launched it Friday, this past Friday, which yes. was the, what? The 17th? 14th. 14th, 14th. 
I'm getting all my days messed Marissa up. Marissa worked really hard on this <laughs> website, guys. <laughs> all my days She's exhausted up. because she can't even yeah. think straight. She worked that hard to get this website yeah, ready for you. It was a work in progress with, for a few months now. Well, really a few years in, in the making, but like a bunch of us AfterBuzzers really worked hard for it. So everything is available at One Stop Shop at AfterBuzz TV. Check it out. Rate, comment, download, tell a friend right from the website. Yeah, nice. you can comment yeah. right there on the website mm -hmm. at us, right? And it's an amazing looking website. I like the gray and like the yellows and it. it just looks so much, I, I think Sweet. it looks so much cooler. It's like a next generation mm -hmm. website now. Yeah. It has everything you need to know. So we're talking about Christina being the killer. We need to break her down more, okay? So how crazy is this? They show the flashbacks, finally. Like, they, yeah. they weren't showing her do mm -hmm. any of this before, which is great because it didn't let us, like, really implicate her in, like, yeah, she's the killer. Because I yeah. thought she was so innocent and stuff before, but now we have all these devious flashbacks where she's, like, looking on her iPad at occult websites, mm -hmm. finding occult stores, going to this occult library and talking to the librarian about, oh, if you wanted to become a werewolf, how could you? And he goes through, like, the three different ways. And the mm -hmm. last one is, like, oh, if you're not born or bit by one, you can drink out of the paw. <laughs> how crazy is that? Pretty That's dirty water. water. That's nasty. <laughs> I wonder I wonder how they did that. She's going to be back here yeah. mm -hmm. uh, next week, right, Marissa? Brea Tingley is coming back. As soon as I saw that, I was like, I got to ask that girl because <laughs> you ain't paying me enough to drink out of dirt. <laughs> so she ends up drinking out of it, and did she know that it was Peter who had changed it? Was she, like, taking a guess that it was him, that it was a werewolf paw? What do you guys I, think? I kind of felt that since she already knew that Peter was a werewolf, that that's how she put together that it was his paw print that she was drinking out of and then hence you know her being kind of sired to him or whatever yeah. that weird mm -hmm. yeah thing was going he on sired her. yeah he mm -hmm. sired her because he was the one who made her yeah i took it that way too yeah that and was i also took odd. it as like that's just who that investigative reporter person that she is like whether what an whatever animal it could have been that she was just going to try it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we, we get to hear her motivation later, you know, just a little bit later in the episode. And ultimately, what I feel it came down to was jealousy. Because I think before we were talking about, oh, maybe someone's just killing all, like, the lesbians out there in mm -hmm. Hemlock Grove, right? Mm -hmm. We were talking about yeah. that potential thing. <laughs> and I feel like she did it out of curiosity as well. She, what do you guys feel? I think your jealousy a lot. I think, I think she, um, you know, I think those girls got to her so badly that she just had such a disdain then for any sort of beautiful, popular, you know, these, these women went after him. The only one I didn't understand was Ginny, because Ginny was the one who kind of complimented her. It was yeah. like, you know that, you know, mm -hmm. those girls are mean and you're beautiful and you're awesome. So that was the only person with the whole me thinking that it, she was getting back at people for being mean to her, bullying her, whatever it was. Jenny to me just was like, wait, but why? No, I agree. I, like, Jenny was the odd man out, but I think maybe Christina saw it as a um, an act of condescension, condescension Con yeah. towards her, so she might have took it in a, a more negative mm -hmm. way. Um, but she did say that, like, she constantly repeated that she just wanted life experience stories mm -hmm. and stuff, and she said so many stories I wanted of my own. And I just kind of fell for her. I'm like, uh, she, this poor girl, she just, you know, wants to experience life. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, this happened to her, and she wasn't expecting it to turn out this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How crazy is it that when she's turning, she describes it as feeling like really sexual, like sexual mm -hmm. euphoria, yeah. and she and because she's a virgin still, she's like, this must be what coming feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude, I was like, <laughs> I, was a I don't know what to, I was like, I don't know what to, if I'm feeling aroused or scared right now. <laughs> and she was saying that she was getting wet and stuff, and I was just mm -hmm. like, wow, this is just like, it's so different because in so many different shows, when werewolves are turning from humans into a werewolf, it's usually like viewed as a painful experience, and, mm -hmm. it, and it looks kind of painful, mm -hmm. but, and well, it looks painful for Peter for sure, but mm -hmm. for her, it seems like so pleasurable, and, it, and she doesn't even care. It's like she really enjoys it, and maybe mm -hmm. that's because she was turned in that way she was like she did the like licking it out of there or maybe it's um maybe it's the way she perceives it yeah and that and she also when she was saying all this she said like fear on her tongue bones beneath my yeah. teeth and her blood run down the fur of my neck there's a lot of lesbian undertones as well to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely 
Definitely, definitely. And I wanted to bring up something else about the, the shedding of the skin. So she sheds her skin off, right? And I, and we see we get to see her white wolf eating yeah. the skin too. And I mm -hmm. thought to myself, dude, if Sheriff Sworn or somebody or like the deputies come in there and like like let's just imagine like this is all going to resolve next episode and everybody's going to come the townsfolk <laughs> how it, if if it eats all of its skin there's no evidence it is, exactly <laughs> that's a, that's exactly. a crazy thing behind I'm like this. how even if you know okay so you kill her yeah but then what you go say oh yeah it was de it was totally christina she turned into a wolf who's gonna believe <laughs> no one yeah. that you know especially yeah. sheriff sworn who's you know got Christina as like a third daughter, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. kind of considering her in that way. But um, I was wondering, what is this other name? Like, because Peter kept yeah. asking her, you know, mm -hmm. like, did you choose to do this or did you hear your other name? And then after she's like in the middle of her orgasm, she's like, I've never heard my other name before. And I thought it was Christina and the Bargolf. Bargolf. Uh, I, well, like, I, I agree too, because I went to the book and that like, I couldn't find that either. They didn't mention the other name. The other name. And there's also another reference to white being not pure. No, like white mm -hmm. is not good. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, so then Christina was, okay, her hair was dark before, so then she was a black Vargolf also before her hair was changing, and now she's white. So she's had like this whole weird transformation, mm -hmm. which yeah. is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. And why didn't Peter, hmm. she told him. I mean, I get it. She was still human, and he's still having this conflict. But she's like, you can kill me as long as you don't hate me. And she was like, you better do it now before I turn. And he yeah. he doesn't. He instead decides to sacrifice his face. Yeah. Well, because mm -hmm. he said that was the... Well, I think him and Destiny were talking about um, how that's the only way. Like, he has to give that as his price for turning into a wolf when it's not the full moon. Yeah, but I'm mm -hmm. just saying, she mm -hmm. said... Kill me now before I turn. Yeah, he could have saved his face. Yeah, he so he would, yeah. then he would have had to turn. <laughs> had to turn. And should be been done. And they could have got Letha <laughs> out of there way before <laughs> that whole transformation yeah. went down. Sometimes yeah. you just need to manhandle a chick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, drag her out of there, Roman. I've seen you do it before. You can do it again. <laughs> There's plenty of that time to get her out of there, safe yeah. and sound. Oh man, I wish yeah. we could talk about more, but yeah. Stephen is giving us the wrap it up music <laughs> over there. Am I right? So um, anyway, just is, quickly, is it, quickly, you guys yeah. want to go through that stuff okay. quickly? quickly? Okay, quickly. Sworn goes nuts. So you know that's that's a pretty short topic. So Sworn this time he's like carrying a shotgun mm -hmm. around everywhere, play, playing with it pretty much in a way. And then he mm -hmm. even goes to the Fredericks house, and he's like protecting them from the Vargulf. It could come back. It could come back at any moment. Yeah. yeah. And his yeah. deputies are like, uh, sir, we need it. Can you, like, go with us? Yeah, you're right? freaking people out. Yeah, yeah. And he's losing it. And he tells Norman to say goodbye to all the girls or mm -hmm. the young girls that he knows and cares about. So yeah. he's losing hope that he's yeah. going to find this golf, far golf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then Shelly, she ends up running off. So yeah. her and Norman have a conversation, right? Well, what was it yeah. exactly? Interesting where he tells her that she's a lamp, you know? Mm -hmm. A lamp. A, a li yeah. lamp. Yeah. Like an innocent lamb. Right? Shine on people. Lamp. Oh, a lamp. lamp. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, shines on people and either illuminates, like, the good in them or the really... Crummy. Yeah, crummy. Yeah, and then she, she ends up finding out from him that Jenny's dead. And Jenny was a good friend to her. Like, she mm -hmm. visited her at the house, and she, she gave her the earrings to get and stuff. And she, she even said, oh, these will look great on you. She was yeah. always really nice to her, and even at the restaurant, too, when she was a, a server over there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But... Um, and then, oh, go ahead. Oh, go I was going to say, how, how do you lose Shelly? <laughs> guys, I mean, when she, <laughs> she runs, she probably you. like shakes the ground a bit. Like, I think we, someone needs to find Shelly. Because... And the lamps are flickering. Too. Yeah, the lamps are flickering. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that too. I thought she like I thought because she was getting blue, mm -hmm, and I was mm -hmm. like, is she having some kind of electrical discharge too? And because her computer turned off too, but maybe she just like pressed the button real fast and turned it off. Yeah, it runs away. And oh. also, you you mentioned Tiana like, how do you lose her? She's so yeah. slow. Yeah. That elevator was slow too. Yeah. How, did yeah. she, how did she? Beat him to the Down ground the floor. Stairs. I mean, uh, there's just so much. Shelly, come that home. That long field, too. <laughs> yeah, that long <laughs> field. <laughs> I'm like, Shelly, how do you lose Shelly? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so she runs off. No bueno. Anyway, Where'd we're going to we're gonna see what happens next time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do predictions real fast, guys? Um, real, real fast. All right, there we go. And now, you're after Buzz TV addiction. I'll start. Roman is going to kill the wolf. 
He will kill the white Vargolf this time, but I feel like he's going to get injured in the process. Mm. Um, but I, And I feel like the Vargolf will remain, but at the same time, Sworn and his deputies are probably going to pin it on Peter no matter what. That's, that's what I feel like. That's what I was asking last week. Like, how do you still clear your name after this? But I'm going to predict that someone, the Order, and um, Shester's brother, Michael, are going to start asking questions about what happened to her. Maybe bring Michael in to finish off what she did not finish. I think we might have an, a reappearance of the Order as well. Somebody coming in to some, I don't know, to kind of... Some I don't know, yeah. Yeah, to, to avenge her death. Showdown's yeah. gonna come yeah. down, I feel yeah. like, between two of the people. Um, I also feel like something bad might happen to Shelly. Mm. Oh no. Yeah. I think we'll see more of Shisor. Yeah. Th this I honestly don't know. Oh, <laughs> so like, this oh, is like Marissa. a real <laughs> prediction. I maybe this is just a wish. I just hope we see more of Shisor. I think she would she could mm. be brought back because we yeah, we don't exactly. know what yeah. he put over her mouth. Maybe he put, like, chlorophyll or something oh, on chloroform. her. chloroform. Yeah. Or yeah. even Shelly was dead as a baby, and he brought her yeah. back. So exactly. maybe he did kill her and still take, took her back. Reanimate her, Project yeah. Aura Bars. It mm -hmm. makes sense, because he did care about her, and yeah. he did. I'd like to see it. He did yeah. care about Chasseur. And it was just such a terrible way for her to die, you know? Yeah. What, what better way to give her new life, you know, and resurrect her? Mm -hmm. I think we'll see Olivia with a new leather coat. <laughs> <laughs> A new dress. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> a new white outfit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I think that about does it for us here at AfterBuzz TV's Hemlock Grove podcast. Uh, be sure to tune in next week, guys, because thanks to Marissa again, we're going to have Freya Tingley, who plays uh, Christina Wendell. Yeah. Christina and, Wendell. Yeah. And we also have Darren Serafian, executive producer and director of Hemlock Grove, calling in next week. Yes. Very cool. Yes. And if you guys want to follow us, you can follow me. Give me a follow at Sean Austin O on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Serafini TV. I'm at Tweet T22. <laughs> and I'm at JJ Jorgens. Thanks so much, guys. We'll buzz with you next week. From Bing.com, executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.